Hey, it's good to see everybody again. Well, not literally see you, but you can see me. And we're going to continue our course here. And we're going to talk a little bit about Sophocles' amazing drama, Oedipus, or Oedipus Rex. Rex, of course, just meaning king. So it's Oedipus the king. Um, I've already asked you, as you're part of your first session, to watch the 1957 production of Oedipus that was in the theaters. It's a very old rendition, and if it feels a little stuffy, part of that is because it is old, and part of that also is the translation. But I love the translation because it's done by one of the greatest <clears throat> poets of the 20th century and even the late 19th century, and that's William Butler Yeats who loved Greek mythology. One of the things that is remarkable when we think of drama, uh, especially in the Greek sense, is that drama is a relatively new invention at this point. Before that, we had bards. We had one-man productions, if you will. You had someone like a Homer who would come in front of everybody and put on a one-man show. The good ones were essentially actors who could play multiple parts and would give these lengthy speeches. Well, this started to turn into a new idea on the, on the stage where you could have multiple people playing different characters who would actually come out and give long monologues in the voice of a particular character. And we can actually see that kind of drama in the Bible in the book of Job, where we see <clears throat> different characters coming out and they give long monologues. But it began to dawn on some of the writers who were staging some of these that people don't always talk like that. People often actually talk to each other. They have this amazing thing called dialogue. What if we could replicate that on a stage? Now we began to see the invention in the Western world of drama. And this drama is something that is with us still. I think that's what we go to see when, we're, when we go to the movie theater. It's what we see on television. A remarkable invention, if you will. And in some ways we can put it right there in Athens as the place where we began for the first time to see this active kind of drama or theater with actors speaking to each other in dialogue. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the play, but I'd like to talk a little bit about Sophocles, because Sophocles himself is a kind of remarkable person. And I don't think any of that would take place without something that <clears throat> we refer to as the Peloponnesian War. This is a very long, almost 30 year war that I personally think is, deserves the attention that it's got. And with so many wars out there, why is it that we still study this war? Well, there are several reasons, not the least of which is, in part because of this war, we actually see some of the most interesting intellectual advancements taking place because it often happens in times of strife, in times of crisis, that creative people find their voice. Now what the Pel Peloponnesian War was, was in the region of what we today think of as Greece, the most powerful country by far, and not even close, is the city of Athens which would have been located around here. Now, Athens, if you will, or maybe you're actually right here, you can see it here. Athens was a city of perhaps as many as two million people. That's a lot of people for that time. And this was a very sophisticated city. This is a city that was wealthy, wealthy perhaps, wealthier than perhaps any other city in, the entire Western world, in large part because of olives. You see, Athens had become wealthy because it was growing olives 
and the olives then were turned into olive oil and then that was sold in the whole region and made the area incredibly wealthy there's even a fun myth that goes with that that has to do with athena for whom the city is named you see there was a there's a story that both Athena, who's the goddess of wisdom, remember the daughter of Zeus, and Poseidon, the brother of, of Zeus, and the god of the sea, that the two of them were contending to become the patron god of this very powerful city. And it seems that it would be apparent that it would be Poseidon because Athens was right there by the sea. They were seafaring peoples. They used the sea for, for, for selling their wares. They had a powerful navy. So it seemed pretty apparent, but Athena also contended to be the patron god, if you will, of, the, of this powerful city. And the two of them began to contend with each other. And the Poseidon, made the case that without the sea, there could be no Athens. That's how they got their powerful navy. That's how they got the water that in many ways helped to power this powerful city. But Athena in turn gave them the olive and the olive became the source of their income. And so because of that, she became the patron god if you look up at the top of Athens, there's that great temple to Athena, the Acropolis. And uh, you could see that they worshiped her. That, and because she's the goddess of wisdom, they worshiped wisdom and philosophy. So it, is, it was an incredibly powerful place. It's difficult to even fully grasp how powerful, but essentially this one little city, well, very large city, it becomes so financially and militarily powerful <coughs> that they began to demand tribute of all of the rest of this region here. And uh, they became almost a little too proud, I think, of their power. And so they demanded financial tribute to these regions. And so these various city states were required to pay money in homage almost like a tax, if you will, only it's a, we won't hurt you if you pay us. And this became very oppressive to these other city-states, but they did it because there was no way they could match its power. But there was one city, and that was down here in this region that we call the Peloponnesus. And that was the city of Sparta. Sparta was a small city of about 90,000. So you have Athens, which has about 2 million people, and you have Sparta, which has about 90,000 people. Now, Athens was a very developed city intellectually. Yes, they had an incredibly powerful navy and army, but they also were the site of the very first democracy in the world. They were the site of schools. That's where uh, people could get an education. They were shockingly for the region very uh, ahead of their time when it came to uh, the treatment of people of different classes. They were in many ways the beginnings of what we might think of as a modern city. Sparta, on the other hand, was a city that had one industry and that was war. So every single man and boy was conscripted to fight in the army. There was not a single <clears throat> male in Sparta that was not in some way trained in the arts of war. And then the women, they worked primarily helping to feed and to provide the needs for this army. And then the regions near them, they would help to pay Sparta for their protection. Well, Sparta did not want to pay tribute to Athens and they declared war on Athens. This seems like a very silly war. If you think about the odds, you have a little city of about 90,000 versus this massive, powerful, wealthy city of Athens with about 2 million people. It would be 
kind of like imagining the city of Lincoln deciding to go up against New York City. The odds don't seem very much in the favor of Lincoln, even if Lincoln were a warlike city. But they have a war and it lasts a little less than 30 years. This war is going to turn into a great disaster for Athens. Now, some of it is just because of the ferocity of the Spartans, but the truth of the matter is, uh, some of it is just because Athens ran into some very bad luck. One of the things they did that was, was just perhaps a poor choice, they decided, well, let's just build a wall so that the Spartans won't be able to penetrate. Uh, this actually seemed like quite a good idea, except that for some reason, once they had built the wall, Athens ended up with a kind of plague, a sickness that uh, decimated the city. Nobody's sure how that exa exactly had happened, but it could be because they were all self-contained there and maybe didn't have adequate plumbing, if you will. That, and they lost a lot of people. They also made some other blunders, but bottom line is blunder after blunder, and I would encourage you, because we don't have time here, to read. If you want to read one of the great works of history, uh, one of the great works of literature even, but Thucydides, the father of modern history, wrote a book called The Peloponnesian War about this great epic war. And, and it's just kind of a fascinating uh, war where you have a mixture of the ferocity of the Spartans, the bad luck of the Athenians, maybe in some ways the arrogance of the Athenians. But during this war, which was economically disastrous to the Athenians, that was quite literally uh, disastrous in that they lost so many people, largely to disease, they end up losing in 404 BCE, uh, and the Spartans win. Uh, this becomes the end of the first great democracy, and we won't actually see a great democracy again for, oh, nearly 2,000 years later. I've often wondered what would have happened to the world and world's history if the Athenians had been allowed to carry out their project, but they weren't. But during this war, in this time of great strife and trauma, here in this little tiny region, we begin to find the birth of modern philosophy. We begin to have Soc Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. We begin to have great poets. And of course, we have great dramatists like Sophocles and Aristophanes. And this isn't surprising because it often happens in times of crisis. I think of the great burst of creative energy that happened around the time of World War II. I think of the burst of energy around the time of World War I. I think of uh, the burst of energy that happened during many of the wars during the Renaissance. There's something about crisis that seems to spur on creative people. So during this time where all seems despair, great things are happening. And in this time, Sophocles is writing and he writes 90 plays. Now these plays I understand are all fantastic, but of the 90 plays, only six of them survive. And three of them are what we today call the Theban plays because all three are set in the city of Thebes. And they all essentially center around the family and the figure of Oedipus. We have Oedipus Rex. We have Antigone, which is about Oedipus's daughter. And then we have a third one called Oedipus at Colonus, which is about an older Oedipus. Once all of this has taken place, he's blinded, but he takes on a kind of prophetic uh, nature. Now, uh, all of the plays that occurred in Athens happened in large part because they were contests. And that was, that's no 
uh, Oedipus is, is no different. Oedipus Rex was put out as a part of a contest. We have no idea what the other plays were in the, this particular contest, but we do know that the great Oedipus Rex, some people argue the greatest play until we get to Shakespeare. I would argue that Sophocles is the greatest dramatist until Shakespeare. But we know that Oedipus Rex or Oedipus the King came in second place, not first place. The first place play, it's lost to us. Uh, as time went on, it's not even memorable enough for us to have kept it. Why did it not win? Well, the play is about Oedipus and how from the time he was born or before he was born, it was predicted in an oracle at Delphi. Now, Delphi is the place where its patron god is Apollo. Now, Apollo, the son of Zeus, is the god of prophecy. And because of that, they have this great uh, temple to Apollo. And if you were to visit this temple to Apollo in Delphi, they would, you would find there a woman. And you could ask of this woman a question. And then the woman would uh, take in some medicinal herbs, we'll say. And also, we believe, would, would take in some of the vapors that were coming from the ground at the time, would get into a kind of stone stupor, and would then begin to babble. And then there would be a priest there who could interpret the babbling and answer the question. So whenever we hear about an oracle from Delphi, what we mean is a prophecy from Delphi, from one of these, these women who would get a message from Apollo and then they would have an answer. It's kind of like, if you will, the magic eight ball of the region. You want to know should I go to war or not? And you could ask the oracle at Delphi, should I marry? Uh, should I kill this particular person? Or in the case of the story of Oedipus, what will become of our son, the son of the king and queen of Thebes? Well, it's predicted by this oracle from Delphi that the son would grow up and kill his father and marry his mother. Now there's a promise for your son, but the king, King Laius, and the queen, Jocasta, well, they, they believe this oracle, and so they do perhaps a logical thing, if not a terrible thing. They decide to have their baby killed because they didn't want to have their son grow up kill his father and marry his mother. So they have his feet bound, actually uh, tethered in a rather cruel sort of way, like you might with a, something you've killed in a hunt. Um, and they give this baby to one of the servants to take out into the mountain and have it die. Servant takes him out, doesn't have the heart to kill the baby, but instead gives the, gives the baby to another servant who happens then to take the, uh, the baby to Corinth and he gets adopted, of course, by the king and queen there. In the end, of course, everything that takes place is exactly what has to take place for this little baby to grow up to become the man who will ultimately kill his father and marry his mother. Well, <clears throat> the Greeks certainly believe in fate. And I wanted to find fate, if I may. Um, here, just excuse me for a moment. I want to define fate. Fate does not mean you have no control over your life. Oedip uh, Odysseus in <clears throat> the Odyssey certainly uh, is facing his fate. And his fate is that he will never get home again because Poseidon has declared it so. But just because it has been declared so, just because that is his fate, does not guarantee that that is the outcome. So the Greeks, while they believe in fate, they don't believe that that means that we're puppets on strings. 
fate to the Greeks means that there are external forces at work affecting our outcome. What they don't believe in, and they're adamantly opposed to believe in, is the concept of fatalism. So fate means there are forces at work for and against me. Fatalism, however, is the belief that, that my outcome is predetermined. Now, if you think about it, fate is not that different. As a matter of fact, it sounds almost identical to the Christian notion of um, providence. We believe that there are outside forces at work uh, on our behalf or against us. The difference is providence is we believe that there, are, there is a force at work for our good. Uh, fate would argue that you have forces working against you, forces working for you, and you must appease those forces in some way. Well, I have, uh, I'm curious to know what you will think of that, and I've asked that as a, one of the questions. Do you see this as a play about fate? Does Oedipus have any say? Well, certainly there are, seem to be forces at work for and against him, but does he actually have any control over the outcome, or is it all pretty much predetermined? Well, his first audience felt that it was, and that's why he came in second place. That's why Sophocles uh, was very upset about that, because he felt that Oedipus absolutely has control over his fate. And rather than, than uh, being against, against his own powers, it's actually his own personal weaknesses that ultimately cause his demise and cause the problem. His anger management problem that he has, the mistakes that he makes that he could have chosen not to make. Um, and it's just that the gods have predicted what will happen, which is not the same thing as saying that they have predetermined that it will happen. Does that make sense? So as we look at this play, I want you to think about this in terms of fate and fatalism. And we've already talked quite a bit about what is the difference between perhaps a people who believe in a good and bad afterlife, uh, like Christians, most Christians do, or a people that believe as the Greeks do, that there really isn't a whole lot of reward and punishment at the end. Well, you could see why a people that have kind of such a pessimistic view of the afterlife would be so adamantly opposed to the idea of fatalism. Because if the ultimate outcome is not all that great. You want to at least believe that I've got some control over this life. Something else I would like to talk about, when we were, when we were reading through the Odyssey, we certainly dealt with what we would call the Homeric hero. But I want to talk about another kind of hero, and that is the Promethean hero. Now the Homeric hero, like Odysseus, We'll see that kind of hero over and over again, and we even see him even in our films today, where you have the great hero going up against great odds, often victoriously, while he may be damaged in the process, but he still will be a victor in the end. Even if he dies, he's kind of a victor. Um, the, this is a wonderful kind of hero, and that's the kind of hero I think we often prefer in our films because it's, it's, it's happy. But there's another kind of hero that the Greeks love, perhaps even more, and that is what I'm calling the Promethean hero, based on the character of Prometheus. Now, in Greek mythology, the uh, humans were at one time essentially like the animals. They were dumb like the animals. They, they seemed to forage for food like the animals. They were really little more than animals. Not nowhere near as intelligent as they would become. Well, the character Prometheus, one of the demigods, feels bad for, for us. And he realizes that with just a little bit of help, we might be able to become something more 
than the animals. And the thing that we lack, the thing that would help us to get over that hump to become something far more would be fire. If we had fire, something that uh, at the time originally is controlled only by the gods, with fire we could then cook our food. With that we could warm ourselves in the winter. With that we could make tools. We could make weapons. With that we could build. Fire is the secret that will begin to create a race of beings that is far superior to that of the animals. Not equal to the gods, but almost equal to the gods in every way, except that they would still be mortal. And so Prometheus does something unthinkable, and that is that as the gods sleep, and we see this in this wonderful uh, painting by uh, Fugger, and that is uh, while the gods slept, he steals the gods' fire and brings it down to humans and gives it to the humans. And of course, the humans, once they get a hold of fire, they begin to spread it to each other. It's kind of like when you put something out on the internet, there's a point where it just, there's no pulling it back. And the gods, when they awake, they realize it's too late. The humans have fire. Soon they will be equal to them in every way, except that they will be mortal. So there's nothing they can do about the humans now, now that they are going to be intelligent. But they can punish Prometheus for this great sin that he has done. And so what they do is they take him and they, uh, they chain him. Zeus has him chained to a rock. And every day, a great bird comes and eats his liver, just devours his liver while he's still alive. And then in the evening, because he's a demigod, the liver grows back. And the next day, the bird comes and eats his liver again. It, it sounds like a painful way to spend eternity, where every day you painfully get to have your liver eaten. So Prometheus is humiliated, defeated, shamed, and tortured for all of eternity to our benefits. And this is very different than the Homeric hero because like the Homeric hero, we all benefit from his actions, but it's only through his absolute defeat and humiliation that we then become the benefit, uh, beneficiaries. The Greeks love this kind of a hero. Um, if you think about it, Christ is very much a Promethean hero where uh, it's through his death, his torture, the humiliation of it, that he ultimately benefits all of humanity. Um, well, I want to argue in some ways that Oedipus is a kind of Promethean hero. So you have the brave and the powerful and the bold Odysseus, who is a little bit more like your Hollywood blockbuster hero. And then you have Prometheus, who gets shamed and disgraced, but in many ways does greater good for everybody. The Greeks love him. And I think that's why, as a myth, they love the, the myth of Oedipus. So when Sophocles is writing during this very tumultuous time there in Athens, he's writing about Oedipus and he's not inventing the story. This is a, this is a story the Athenians know. They already know the story of Oedipus, but he's putting his own spin on it. And his spin on it is he's turned it into a kind of whodunit story, kind of the mystery, who killed King Laius? And what's interesting is it's uh, Oedipus who's actually exploring this, trying to find out who is responsible for the death of Laius. And the closer he gets to the truth, the more he begins to realize it's himself. And despite the fact that he even realizes at one point that he is the culprit, he doesn't stop the investigation. He goes all the way to the end, to the point where he's willing to have his own eyes gouged out. Now, the Oedipus myth begins, and it's hinted at in the play, 
that it begins that that Oedipus or Oedipus, now Oedipus actually is a terrible name to give a child because it means swollen foot. Because remember as a baby, his feet were cruelly tethered like an animal. And so his feet are kind of permanently disfigured and handicapped. So Oedipus or swollen foot, but he's very, very intelligent. And the city of Thebes is in great turmoil because a sphinx has come. Now a sphinx is a woman, you see right here in this, this uh, jar, the, uh, it's a woman with the body of a lion and the wings of an eagle. And they're generally ferocious, very much like the sirens. And she is, she has a riddle. And, if, uh, and a man who can answer this riddle will become king. And if they can't, then she devours them or she kills them. But Oedipus comes into the town, realizes the turmoil, answers the riddle. And so he becomes king. He's almost kind of like haphazardly becomes the king. Um, the previous king had died already. So he decides to bring unity to the place and he marries the queen. Little does he know that that queen is also his mother. Um, here's a, a picture that I absolutely have loved. I love art, as you already know. And uh, this is uh, Ingress's Oedipus and the Sphinx. I like this very much because you get a ferocious looking Sphinx and he's answering her riddle, um, and, uh, which will of course defeat her. Here's another one where he's answering. I don't know why Oedipus is always depicted naked. Uh, I think it's just because people were looking for an excuse to paint naked people. Uh, here is the Renoir uh, painting where Oedipus will come out with his eyes gouged out. Oedipus has been one of the most popular stories for artists. Here is a, an engraving from a book version and here's one from, I don't know if you like Max Ernst, one of the great uh, modernist paintings. It's called Oedipus Rex. Uh, I have no idea why, but I like this one better, which is the Kirkpatrick piece called Oedipus Rex, where you actually see in this sort of uh, uh, collage, uh, different elements of the story of Oedipus. And I especially love this, this fake movie poster of Oedipus. Um, so it's a wonderful story, even though it's a terrible story. Um, so I want you to pay attention to this. I want you to pay attention to the skill with which Sophocles tells this story. And he tells it again as a kind of whodunit. Who killed Laius? And Oedipus is going to get to the bottom of this by gum. And it turns out to be himself. Now, one of the interesting aspects is there's a character in this play, Tiresias, the blind prophet. This is the exact same Tiresias that we've already seen in the underworld in the Odyssey. He's a character actually we run into often. And in Greek mythology, Roman mythology, African mythology, the Celts, uh, in the Northern European mythologies, and so many mythologies, even in Native American mythologies, prophets are often depicted as blind. And I have asked that question, why do you think that is? I have my own theory on why this is, which I will answer later, but I've thrown that question out, and I'd like you to think about that. Why is it? Tiresias is an especially sad example, though, because the reason why he's blind is part of why he's a prophet. He is a prophet, but he wants to be a greater prophet who can see into the future. So he seeks out the gods in order to be able to see the future. And he's promised that he will see the future uh, if he, in turn, gives away his eyesight. So in exchange for his eyesight, he's given a glimpse of the future. Unfortunately, it's a very cruel glimpse because the only thing he's told is the day on which he will die. If there's one thing in the future you probably don't want to know, and that's the day you're going to die. That's one thing you'd like to remain a mystery. So poor Tiresias. He's a tragic figure, but he's blind, and he is a, uh, a prophet of Apollo. He seems to have 
great insight. And in this play, he seems to tell the truth that with every line he speaks, notice how he tells the truth. Oedipus doesn't want to believe him, but he tells the truth. And he tells the truth about, about seeing and light and dark. And it's all hinting to the fact that Oedipus himself will soon be blind. And upon really seeing, that's when Oedipus will go blind. Uh, it's delicious irony. So I have a question for you here at the end of this video. I'd like you to take a look at that. And I hope you're having a great week. And uh, I look forward to your responses. And I also look forward to your responses to the discussion thread. Keep that up. You're doing a great job. So, hey, thank you so much.